Today's episode was sponsored by Amanda over on Patreon as an anniversary present for her husband. So congratulations on four years, you two, and let's go ahead and get this guy up on the wall. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how in frame it is, but I promise you that it is there on the wall, sewn to the quilt. I asked Amanda if she had any special message she wanted me to say, and she did. So, um, happy anniversary, my love. Welcome to the internet. To be clear, that was Amanda's special message. I wasn't saying, I wasn't calling you my love. I don't, I don't love you. I mean, I could probably get to love you if, if I got to know you a little better. But, but, but right now I don't feel like, maybe I do love you, but like, I, I wouldn't call you my love. That seems a little strong. I think I saved that. But for real, happy anniversary, you guys. It's an honor that I get to celebrate it with you in some small way. And with that, let's start the episode. Hello, knitwits, and welcome to Knitting Time with Willie. I'm your host, Willie Muse, joined as always by my co-host, Nicholas. And if there's one thing that I love, it's a good old-fashioned mystery. From Jack the Ripper and the Zodiac to Cicada 3301 and that missing Malaysia Airlines flight, the world we live in is full of many great unknowns. And I have wasted many, many hours of my life consuming all the content I can about them. There's honestly just something so satisfyingly unsatisfying to me about learning about some weird corner of the world without a clear explanation and then spending an absurd amount of time looking for every bit of information you can to try and explain it. I kind of feel like researching theories about famous mysteries is the mental equivalent of scratching a mosquito bite, you know? It feels so good to get that moment of relief that you want to keep doing it and doing it, even though all you're really doing by doing it is making that itch worse and worse, and that just makes you want to keep doing it even more. And because this is the vicious cycle that a great mystery can inspire, they tend to consume a lot of us, myself very much included. When my interest is piqued by something unsolved, it's pretty much the only thing I want to talk about. And that's not always a good thing, especially because a large part of my life is coming on here and talking about stuff that's... well, not that. And that unfortunately brings me to this thing that you're watching right now, because when it came time for me to figure out what the topic of my next video was going to be, a large chunk of my already limited mental space was being occupied by thoughts of one of the greatest mysteries of the modern era, D.B. Cooper. For those of you who don't know, D.B. Cooper was, well, a terrorist, but, but, but he, was, he was like a cool, sleek, fun terrorist. On November 24th, 1971, a man calling himself Dan Cooper purchased a plane ticket going from Portland, Oregon to Seattle, Washington. Dressed in a suit and tie with his hair combed back, the man took his seat and ordered a bourbon and 7-Up before calmly slipping the flight attendant a note informing her that he had a bomb in the briefcase on his lap. In exchange for the safety of everyone on the flight, D.B. Cooper demanded $200,000 and four parachutes, which he was ultimately given. After he got his money, he released everyone on board save for the crew and took the plane back into the air to continue the initial flight from Portland to Seattle. At 8 p.m., a light came on in the cockpit telling the pilot that the cabin door had been opened and the staircase had been deployed. And Then at 8.13, the crew felt a sudden movement coming from the rear of the plane as though a significant amount of weight had just been jettisoned. 
In the dark of the night, D.B. Cooper took his money and jumped, never to be seen again. Dun, dun, dun. I don't know. I feel like I'm not very good at building suspense, but I promise you that it is a very interesting story. And yeah, the world has been kind of obsessed with figuring out the true identity of D.B. Cooper for decades now. And I personally have been obsessed with it for about a week and a half. I think what makes it so intriguing is the fact that there are so many plausible theories out there. Like, like, like it is honestly remarkable how many old men from the Pacific Northwest could have conceivably been a domestic terrorist in the 70s. There have been so many times where I hear about a potential suspect and with each new piece of information I hear I'll become more and more convinced that he is D.B. Cooper only to then hear about somebody else and immediately be like, oh no, fuck that last guy. I think that this new dude did it. And what makes things even more intriguing is that every last one of the seemingly perfect candidates has one glaring reason why they could never be D.B. Cooper. Like, you'll be researching a guy and it's like, his name is Dan Cooper. He had extensive training as a paratrooper. And he frequently told his friends that one day he was going to hijack an airplane on the night before Thanksgiving. And you'll just be like, uh-huh, uh-huh, I like the sound of this one. But then you'll keep going and get to a part that says that this Dan Cooper actually had a tail that stuck out of the back of his pants and his face was bright blue with polka dots and you'll think like, okay, I don't remember anyone mentioning D.B. Cooper having a tail. Uh, that feels like something that probably would have come up. But then instead of being like, okay, I guess it's not that guy, you just start to think of ways that someone with a tail and a blue face could be D.B. Cooper, you know? You start to think that maybe he wore makeup and wrapped his tail around his waist like a belt like a Saiyan would do. And the next thing you know, it's 2 a.m. and you're still up researching what makeup was like in 1971 to see if covering up blue skin would have been something that was even possible because... What you need more than sleep is to feel in some small way like you have answers. And of course, you'll never actually feel that way because this mystery has already eluded hundreds of people who are way more invested than you could ever be. So odds are very slim that whatever light like Googling you do in lieu of rest is going to be what cracks the case. So yeah, then it just kind of sticks with you in a way that's annoying, but... I don't know, it's like a good annoying. It's it's kind of like the world is taunting you with how cool it is and how much left of it there is to explore. And like I said, it can be distracting. I find it hard enough to focus on writing when my brain is focused on writing. So when it's focused on something completely unrelated, productivity starts to feel like a bit of an uphill climb. And I'm sure that right now some of you are thinking, why not just make the thing I'm already focused on the thing I'm supposed to be focused on by doing a video about D.B. Cooper. And to you I say, fuck you, I already thought of that. I genuinely considered making a video about the mystery of D.B. Cooper, you know, telling the facts, going over the possible suspects, giving my thoughts, stuff like that. But after considering it a little bit longer... I realized that I definitely shouldn't be doing that. There are already a bunch of videos and podcasts like that out there, and I don't really know what new thing my version would bring to the table, especially because, well, I would more than likely be getting all of my information for my version from said videos and podcasts. So then I started to think about ways that I could do my own version of a D.B. Cooper video, and... That's when I remembered that this isn't the first time that D.B. Cooper has come up on this channel. A while back, I made a video about a movie called 1313 Giant Killer Bees, and like, I honestly kind of recommend you guys go back and watch that video. I promise it won't be necessary in order to enjoy this one, but I may not cover some things here if I already talked about them there, and 
Also, I just like the video and think that it's my favorite one I've done in this series so far, so you should go watch it. That, that, that feels very weird to me. I'm not used to saying nice things about myself. Left a weird taste in my mouth. Still, on the off chance that you don't feel like watching an old hour and a half long video on a whim, then I'll give you the bullet points, which are that it was directed by a man named David DeCocteau. He's probably best known for a film he made called A Talking Cat, but on top of that, he also has a huge library full of hundreds of other extremely low budget movies that he's made, and many of those movies are also softcore gay pornos. Actually, calling them softcore might even be a little bit generous, because I feel like they don't even fall within the core system of rankings. They, they have absolutely no core to them whatsoever. I think that the best way to describe them might be to say that they are the pornographic equivalent of clickbait. They're advertised with all these pictures of buff shirtless dudes, and the implication is that if you were to watch the actual movie, you get to see those dudes naked and possibly smooching on one another, but that is not actually the case. What you actually get is a lot of chest rubbing and above the waist showering wrapped up in these extremely boring movies that are somehow less narratively interesting than actual porn. And it was while I was discussing one of these boring movies for this channel and giving a little taste of DeCocteau's filmography that I said this. According to IMDb, his works include such classics as Santa's Summer House, 90210 Shark Attack, and Bigfoot vs. D.B. Cooper. And based solely on those titles, I feel like we can safely assume that this dude isn't really trying to make high art here. Gr granted, Bigfoot vs. D.B. Cooper sounds good as hell, but trust me when I say that based on the movies of his that I've seen, I feel pretty confident in saying that it's not. And truth told, when I made my first video about a DeCocteau film, that was the one that I really wanted to talk about. And now that I find myself in the middle of a D.B. Cooper rabbit hole, it feels like the perfect time. So I searched for Bigfoot vs. D.B. Cooper on streaming services, and then I was instantly reminded why I didn't do it the first time around, because this stupid movie is not online anywhere. It's not on Netflix, it's not on Hulu, Amazon Prime has a page for it, but when you actually go to watch it, it says that the movie's not available, so I don't really know what that's about. And then when the more mainstream services failed me, I turned my attentions to the sketchier ones, but those were a bust too. Which is honestly surprising, because if there was ever a movie that should be on Tubi, it's this one. I thought I found it for rental on a service called Voodoo, so against my better judgment, I gave them my credit card information and paid $3.99 to rent it, but when I went to watch it, I realized that they had actually given me a movie called Man vs. Bigfoot instead. I'm not entirely sure why that happened. I guess that they just assumed that someone paying $4 for Bigfoot vs. D.B. Cooper would accept whatever piece of shit voodoo threw at them, but I was not happy about it. And when I felt like I had exhausted all of the streaming services, I moved on to Plan B and searched streaming services. Only this time I did it in other countries. Since Amazon had a page set up for it, I figured that might mean that a copy of it existed somewhere in the back end, and maybe it was accessible in other countries. So I used a VPN and just started changing my location to random places in the world in hopes that eventually things would work out. Unfortunately though, there are a lot of places in the world, so while the movie may be available in one of them, I was not able to figure out which one that was, and it did not feel worth it to me to go through all of them when odds felt just as likely that this movie had just been scrubbed from the internet entirely. Clearly, streaming services were getting me nowhere, so I started to wish that there was another way to watch movies, and that's when I remembered that there was. DV something or other. 
Though part of me was extremely depressed at the idea that any amount of man hours went into making a physical copy of this movie, a much larger part of me really wanted to watch it, so I went to eBay for the first time in two decades and searched for it there. To my surprise, there was actually a copy of it available for purchase, and after spending 20 minutes trying to figure out what my PayPal password was, I bought that copy. It came a few days later, and my search was finally over. Kinda. Because it wasn't until I had already purchased the DVD that I remembered that my laptop does not have a DVD player on it, so I had to spend 20 bucks on an external one of those and wait for it to arrive, but when it finally did, I was ready to make my video. Almost. Because just because I had the DVD and a way to play it on my computer, that didn't mean that I had a way of extracting video from the DVD so that I could play it for you here. So I googled apps that let you rip video files from DVDs and downloaded like six of them, and 18 computer viruses later I eventually found one that seemed to work, so I was finally ready to go. For the most part. Because unfortunately, the program kept saving the file in a folder that I, for the life of me, did not know how to access. Like you'd think that typing the name of the file into the search function on your computer would make it come up, but that is apparently not the case, so I had to instead spend like an hour manually searching through every corner of my hard drive, trying to find it. But eventually I did get there. Ish. Because when I found the file, it turned out that the program had only downloaded half of the movie, so I had to download it a second time, and then when it finally downloaded, I forgot how I found the folder it went to the first time, so I had to spend another hour searching for that again, but once I did, I finally had a usable file of Bigfoot vs. D.B. Cooper. And after spending all of that time and money and effort trying to get this damn thing, this is what I got in return. Okay, before I can go over the actual plot of this movie, I feel like I need to tell you guys the plot I was expecting, because... Well, it's very different. When D.B. Cooper jumped out of that plane, he landed in the woods of the Pacific Northwest, which also happens to be the area in the United States that has the most Bigfoot sightings. So I figured that this movie would be combining those two pieces of information in literally any way. My assumption going in was that this movie would start with D.B. Cooper jumping from the airplane, and then he'd land in the woods where he'd be stalked by Bigfoot, and have to fight him off in order to pull off the final stage of his heist. Instead, what we get is this. We open on a long take of a shirtless guy who is not D.B. Cooper walking through the woods. I was only 22 years old when this story began, but I remember it like it was yesterday. I told my family and visiting relatives that I was going out on a turkey shoot. It was November 24th, 1971, the day before Thanksgiving. And if you wanted a turkey feast, by golly, you had to shoot and kill the bird yourself. Okay, just right off the bat, that is categorically not true. I guarantee you could buy a frozen turkey in the time that this movie took place. It was the 70s, not the Old West. Which, yeah, this movie is supposed to be a period piece, so keep that in mind while I'm showing you these clips, because it does make them a lot funnier. Like, there's nothing specific I noticed that I could point to and be like, they clearly didn't have that in the 70s, but everything about this is just so clearly 2014 that when they start talking about Vietnam and shit, you're just like, huh? But yeah, he definitely could have bought a turkey, and I felt the need to point that out, but that is also a very small quibble, and if I stop to point out every small quibble I have with this movie, we will be here for a very long time. So let's get back to the voiceover. Little did I know, as I took that fateful trip, I would encounter something far more dangerous and a hell of a lot bigger 
than turkeys. And what I have just shown you is all of this movie's opening dialogue. And if we're being honest, I probably could have just skipped it because it's not interesting or informative to the plot in any way. But I figured I'd include it anyway because after that, we don't get another hint of human speech for 10 goddamn minutes. When the voiceover stops, we get our first taste of Bigfoot in the form of growls and a stagehand hanging out beneath the frame of the camera, shaking the skinniest trees they can find. And after that, we just kind of watch the guy walk through the woods for a long time. Uh, like, like, like a very long time. And like, part of me wants to show you guys this entire sequence in full just so you guys know the hells I go through in order to make these things, but a much larger part of me knows that if I did that, then every last one of you would stop watching this video. So instead, I'm going to split the difference and show you guys a version of the scene that I have set to 1775 times speed so that it is only 30 seconds long. And like, even this feels pretty long and boring. So like, feel free to skip ahead. Had I not altered that footage, it would have lasted for 8 minutes and 52 seconds. For comparison, the song American Pie is 8 minutes and 42 seconds, and that manages to tell the story of decades of music history. With an extra 10 seconds, Bigfoot vs. D.B. Cooper barely manages to tell the story of how a muscle queen got from his car to a hunting lodge. What makes things worse is the fact that this is not a long movie. Including the credits, it clocks in at just under an hour and 15 minutes, so the fact that 9 of those minutes are just a dude taking a very uneventful hike is insane. Like, I did the math, and the opening sequence is 12% of the entire film. That's nearly one eighth of the movie dedicated to a guy just kinda taking a stroll, and to say that it is boring is an understatement. I think a better way to describe it would be to say that it consumes you. You watch it and it just keeps going, but you keep thinking like, surely it can't go on like this for that much longer, but it does. And then eventually you kind of just get to a place where you're like, okay, I guess this is just my life now. By the time we get to something new, it's genuinely kind of jarring because you become so wrapped up in the monotony of watching this dude walk aimlessly through the woods that you kind of forget that there's supposed to be a movie on the other side of this scene. And for me personally, it did not help matters much that the movie immediately segues into the D.B. Cooper stuff because despite the fact that this movie is called Bigfoot vs. D.B. Cooper, I had completely forgotten that he was supposed to be in this thing, so seeing him suddenly pop up out of nowhere was weird. It was so weird, in fact, that I kind of started to wonder how Cooper would even fit into this story at all, and the short answer is, well, that he doesn't. Uh, D.B. Cooper is barely in this movie. My hunch is that this entire production probably came about because David DeCocteau was in a similar rabbit hole as I am, and so when it came time for him to make his next movie, he decided to hastily cram his current obsession into an unrelated script he already had about Bigfoot. Aside from the very last scene, all of the D.B. Cooper stuff is limited to a few quick dramatizations of the facts of the case, that are entirely removed from the rest of the plot. Like, we are a little bit over 12 minutes in at this point, and 
This right here is the first taste of D.B. Cooper we actually get. While I was going about my business, another man, a rather famous or should I say infamous individual, had some plans of his own on that very same day. That's it, that's all the D.B. Cooper we get, and then once that's over, we immediately cut back to the woods where we continue with the A story, which, again, despite the title of this movie, does not include D.B. Cooper in literally any way. The shirtless hiker has finally arrived at his destination, a gigantic estate posing as a cabin in the woods that I can only assume is David DeCocteau's actual home. Like, like I looked it up, and his Wikipedia page says that he resides in Los Angeles in British Columbia, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say that this is his British Columbia residence. And, like, I will be perfectly honest. I don't really get what the deal with this house is, because, like, the main dude says he was expecting it to be empty, but... When he gets there, he learns that it's actually been rented for the weekend for a bachelor party. So, like, I don't really get how that happens. Like, was he just going up to random houses and hoping they'd be vacant? Does he own the house and just happen to forget that he rented it out on the same weekend that he was also planning on helping his friend pull off an aviation heist? I haven't really come up with an explanation that fully makes sense to me, but whatever the case may be, there are more hunks now. Can I help you? I'm sorry, I thought this house was vacant. <laughs> we rented it for the holiday. We? Hey, man. Hey, how's it going? What's going on, buddy? Yeah, this is uh, Chuck, Johnny, Lou, and Morgan. What's up, guys? How come Chuck gets to wear a shirt? I have a lot to say about this movie script, but I do believe in giving credit where credit is due. So I'll give it this. That was some very efficient character introduction. In the span of a few seconds, the movie manages to not only name every single one of its supporting characters, but it also conveys to the audience that they're staying in the same house together and that they frequently walk around without their shirts on. And those are literally the only two things that you need to know about them. And in a weird coincidence, the main guy is also walking around without his shirt on. And it's perhaps because of this that they invite him to join their group. You want to join us for some turkey shooting? Yeah, I'm, I'm here for turkey shooting. Awesome. It's the season. Right. Yeah. You want to have a beer with us? Yeah, I'll take a beer. Alright, come on. Let's go. Come on in. Come on in. Hey, so you're just gonna invite the random stranger who showed up at your doorstep with a gun around his shoulder in for a beer without talking it over? Alright, I guess the 70s really were a simpler time. Which, yeah, don't forget, this movie is supposed to be set in the 70s. The main dude accepts their invitation, but we hear through voiceover that he had a bad feeling about it. And like, you'd think that the bad feeling would stem from the fact that he clearly just willingly entered into a gay sex cult. But as it turns out, it's actually because while all this is happening, these studs are being watched. I hadn't expected anyone else being up here, but they seemed like a good bunch of guys, so I was happy to play along. Morgan was getting married in a week, so this was like a last hurrah for them all. At the time, I didn't realize how true that would be. I also couldn't get over the feeling that someone was watching me. I thought I was being just paranoid, but for some reason, I couldn't shake that sense of dread. I truly have no idea how they managed to show so little of the Bigfoot costume and still make it look terrible. Uh, like, honestly, if I didn't know any better, I would assume that that was a silhouette of the panda from Turning Red. 
After the main dude makes his way inside the house, we cut back to the D.B. Cooper storyline, where DeCocteau gives us a fairly accurate recreation of events that leads me to believe that he read the same Wikipedia pages that I did. Uh, stewardess, could you come here for a second? Yes, sir. Is there a problem? Thank you, sir. I'll read it later. Uh, you should really take a look at that note right now. I have a bomb. Okay, I get that it was a simpler time and airplane hijackings were still new, but I still think that even in the 70s, a flight attendant would have been able to tell the difference between a real bomb and a bunch of paper towel tubes wrapped in twine. Which, like, let's be real, there is no way in hell that anyone involved in this movie actually thought that prop looked good. So, I kinda don't get why they even bothered with it at all. Like, obviously the people making this movie didn't really have a budget, so I'm not gonna fault them for not having a more realistic looking bomb. But, if that is the case, then just don't show the bomb at all. You can get away with a lot by just zooming the camera in on the stuff that does look good and implying that everything out of the frame is what you say it is. And I feel like the people making this movie know that better than anyone. After all, if you zoom in on the reflection on D.B. Cooper's sunglasses, you can see that the airplane is clearly the same house that the rest of the movie was shot in. So I don't know why they didn't apply similar filmmaking techniques to hiding the fact that their explosive device was cobbled together out of things that the director found in his recycling bin. The scene lasts for around 90 seconds before cutting back to the main storyline. And after that, we don't return to the airplane for another 30 minutes. But I mean, come on, it's not like anybody is watching Bigfoot vs. D.B. Cooper for D.B. Cooper. So now it's time for DeCocteau to give the people what they really came to see. Four uninterrupted minutes of two dudes going for a jog. I'm tempted to say that what follows is just a repeat of the first scene because it is also just a bunch of long boring shots of people making their way through the woods. But thankfully, things are made slightly more tolerable by the fact that this time around, they've cut in a bunch of shots of a guy in a really bad Bigfoot costume running from tree to tree. Was Bigfoot just doing the Charleston? This sequence comes to an end when the guys hear Bigfoot and get spooked off. I'm never getting married at this age. No. Or just way too young. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's, you're pretty much ruining your life. Why would you throw your freedom like that? Right? Exactly. What is it? Thought I heard something. Yeah, are there bears in these woods? I wouldn't count the possibility. You know, I'd feel a lot better if we had our rifles. Yeah, I think we can start heading back. Yeah, fast. And what I love about that clip is that they're trying to do the thing where they start the scene in the middle of a conversation, but we have seen every last step of the run leading up to that conversation, and they have been very conspicuously not talking. Based on what we see here, I have to assume that these two men were silent for the better part of an hour before one of them decided to start a conversation mid-sentence and the other one just kind of went with it. Although for the record, please know that I do not blame the actors for the quality of this or any other scene. Uh, like I honestly think that they might be improvising right now and even if I'm wrong, I do not get the sense that they're getting a lot of help from behind the camera. 
If I had to guess, I'd say that the only note they were given for this scene was to make sure that they don't block their nipples, because when they turn and run away, they're holding their arms wide in a way that does not feel particularly natural. Those muscle hunks swing their arms like a gorilla long enough that they eventually make it home though, and when they get there, they do what everyone does when they get home from a run. They strip down to their underwear and change into new pants before even going in the house. And once back inside, they find the rest of their shirtless chums making plans. So Bernie, are you gonna join us on the hunt? Yeah, we're gonna head out and split up into a team of two. Make it kind of like a contest and see who can kill the most birds. How the fuck many turkeys do you need? Most of the time, one is too many. These guys are gonna be making sandwiches out of leftovers until New Year's. Yeah, and six of us, it makes it even. Five. I'm a lover, not a killer. <laughs> Come on, Morg. She hasn't cut your balls off yet, has she? <laughs> Whatever, I'm taking a shower. After three hours in the Bronco with you guys, I need it. That right there is what you call foreshadowing. His shower is a very big chunk of this movie. Also, why is that guy being such an asshole to Morg? What did Morg ever do to you? I mean, this movie is very 70s, obviously, and machismo was a lot worse back then, but even still, I feel like these guys should be a little bit nicer to their friend because the reason they're on this trip to begin with is to celebrate Morg's bachelor party. It's bad enough that they decided to take him turkey hunting, even though that's clearly not something he wanted to do, but the fact that on top of that, they're also openly shitting on his impending marriage makes me think that Morg should probably get better friends. Whatever though, he's gonna be dead soon anyway, so. Once the guys have their plan set, it's time for them to get ready, and the movie shows them getting ready in excruciating detail. Like, it would be a stretch to say that the majority of this movie is just watching these dudes get changed into shorts so they can go hunting, but certainly a plurality of it is. And I feel like a lot of you guys aren't going to believe what I'm about to tell you, so Please just listen to the words I'm saying and know that everything that happens next in this movie plays out exactly how I'm describing it. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not heightening anything for comedic effect. These are just the cold hard facts. It all begins with one of the shirtless muscular dudes whose name I do not know slowly ascending the stairs to his room. I'm not entirely sure why we needed to actually see him going up the stairs, but apparently we did. This movie seems to think that the audience won't be able to comprehend how someone got to a new location unless we see every step that they took to get there. Also, I'm not entirely sure why he is the only one going up the stairs, because there are like six people who are supposed to be getting ready right now. The scene before this one literally ends with Stairs Dude and another guy walking upstairs together. Let the killings begin. After we gear up. I'm not going out there again without my rifle. Ditto. I don't know what happened to the little one after that, but apparently he's gone now. Eventually, hunk number one makes it to the top of the steps and goes into his bedroom to take off his pants. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why he needed to go to his bedroom to do this. We literally just saw him drop trow on the front lawn, but apparently somewhere in the last three scenes he developed a sense of modesty. Once he's down to his skivvies, the movie begins a sequence that I think is supposed to be erotic, but really it's just extremely dull. And I think they know it's dull too, because the moment he starts to strip, they pipe in this weird public domain version of the Rocky score to try and make everything seem more interesting than it actually is.
Okay, not gonna lie, that song slaps, but it's not enough to save what happens next. Once he's down to his weird Book of Mormon undies, he picks up his gun and just kind of poses with it in front of the mirror for a bit. Get him. Right there, right there. Ooh. I'm sorry, did he just pull the trigger? Uh, I'm the first to admit that I'm not an expert here, but I'm pretty sure that goes against some pretty basic safety rules of gun ownership. The posing goes on for a while, and it's all very gun-centric in a way that almost led me to believe that posing in front of a mirror with a gun is a specific fetish that a lot of people have, and that's who this movie was made for. Although then I thought about it a little longer and realized that even if that is the case, it doesn't make this movie make any more sense, because unless that fetish is called Bigfoot vs. D.B. Coopering, there's no way that anyone would know going into this how much of it there is here. Like, I like to think that someone out there got very lucky by turning this on and watched this scene like, there's so much of my very specific kink in here, hooray! But I feel like odds are much more likely that people got to this point in the movie and reacted the same way that I did by fast forwarding to see how much longer this shit goes on for. It's a long time. Still, if Bigfoot vs. D.B. Coopering is a thing, then I know of at least one person who's actually into it, and that's Bigfoot himself, because while all of this gun posing is going down, he's watching from a nearby window and perving out. I'm not sure what window that is exactly, because the one window in this room is always visible in the background, and there's no Bigfoot in it. And I'm also not sure why Bigfoot is so dark, because as we can clearly see through said window, it is daytime outside. And yeah, the guy kind of just keeps posing while Bigfoot presumably touches himself in the dark. Eventually, the dude decides that he's had enough of his own reflection, so he finally puts on a new pair of pants and leaves the room. And watching him cross through that door frame, I was overcome with an intense feeling of relief knowing that this scene was finally over. Unfortunately, that good feeling was short-lived because as soon as this scene ends, we immediately cut to another one of the dudes climbing to the top of the stairs. He too goes to his room, strips to his underwear, and poses in the mirror with a gun for an extremely long time while Bigfoot watches from the shadows. He then finishes getting ready and leaves his bedroom, and we immediately cut to another guy walking up the stairs. And then another one after that. Each time a guy walks up the stairs, strips to his underwear, poses half naked in front of a mirror with a toy hunting rifle, and puts on a pair of shorts and leaves. And all the while, Bigfoot is watching each and every last one of them from a nearby window. And when one guy finishes getting changed, they immediately bring in another guy and do the exact same thing all over again. It's kind of like the Teletubbies, but for sad gay perverts. Though at 12 minutes and 44 seconds this sequence feels like it takes forever, it does eventually end, and 
The guys leave the house in a single file line like the seven dwarves to go turkey hunting. With the house to himself, Morg is finally able to take that shower he mentioned all those years ago. So hold on to your butts because things are about to get steamy. Because of the shower. This is probably the most explicit part of the movie, but it's still fairly tame, all things considered. It all begins with Morg calling his fiance from a landline because this is a period accurate story set in the 1970s. How you doing? Good. What are you wearing? Mmm, that's sexy. You miss me? Good, I miss you too. I'm about to go take a shower. Yeah, I stink real bad. Okay, baby, I'll be thinking of you. Naturally, a steamy conversation like that gets Morg all horned up, so he strips down to the buff to finally take that shower. Granted, we don't really see very much of him in the buff, but it is heavily implied that he is, so... Yeah, sexy. Like, I think that if there was anyone watching this that was still holding out hope that eventually this movie would show us the full Monty, those hopes would probably be dashed the moment they saw this. And really, I feel like that short clip is probably the best encapsulation I can think of of what it's like watching one of these movies, you know? Just a lot of clumsy teasing that cuts away the second you get to anything interesting. Still, though I wouldn't necessarily say that anything that happens in this scene is pornographic, it does get the closest to being so of anything that I've seen in a DeCocteau film. There are moments here that I'm not sure I can show you without violating YouTube's decency standards, and after making two fairly in-depth videos about these movies, that is the first time that that's ever happened. Like, we actually get a hint of butt crack, which I was not expecting. I mean, granted, I don't think that it was intentional. I think the camera guy just accidentally dropped his camera too low for a second and they left it in. But after nothing but chess for the past 45 minutes, it was a nice change of pace. Although that said, seeing Morg's ass did also bum me out a little bit because it means that even though no nudity is shown, the actors are still sometimes naked on set. And for whatever reason, that makes these movies feel way worse. Uh, I'm starting to suspect that they're more for the people making them that, that, than for the people watching them. Still, even if the actor wasn't fully nude in this scene, it would still be the raunchiest thing I've seen from DeCocto, and I think that's because it's the first time that these movies have included anything that's actually sexual. And, and that's a weird thing to say, given the nature of these movies, so... Let me explain. Even though everyone is running around in their underpants, the situations they're in are all generally pretty sexless. Like, the movie has no problem showing you three quarters of a naked muscle hunk, but if you want to sexualize him, that's your business, and you're going to have to do all the legwork on it. I think a good example of what I'm talking about here is the closest equivalent of this shower scene that we got in 1313 Giant Killer Bees, where a dude lies on his bed in his underwear and just kind of rubs his chest for, for a weirdly long time. And I will be honest, I'm still not entirely sure what the fuck it is that I'm looking at there, but that said, I do know what the fuck it isn't. This shower scene is different though. Aside from that one slip of the camera, it all takes place above the waistline, which gives people the opportunity to let their minds fill in the blanks based on implications. And the implications strongly suggest that this guy is... Well, doing something that I don't know the YouTube-friendly way of describing. Onanism, maybe? I would wager to bet that this guy is doing a lot of the same rubbing as the guy in the bed was, but because we can see less of it, it ironically feels way more explicit. 
Uh, like I watched this movie for the first time at the gym and this scene made me feel like a massive creep because anyone who caught a glimpse of my screen would have probably assumed that I was just watching porn on the treadmill. So, so yeah, that was fun. Still, though the scene itself is definitely more explicit than anything I've seen from DeCocto, I'd still argue that what exactly he's supposed to be doing here is not made 100% explicit. I almost get the sense that they were trying to make the sexiest scene they possibly could while still having enough plausible deniability that if anyone called them out on it, they could still be like, what, what are you even talking about? This is just a guy taking a nice normal shower. If he is engaging in onanism, he's doing it very weirdly. Uh, like, like a lot of it is two-handed in a way that feels very non-traditional. And like, I think that the movie is implying something specific that guy is doing there, but when I look at that, I also can't shake the feeling that if they were to zoom the camera out all the way, we just see a very wet naked man flapping his elbows like a chicken. And I don't know, maybe if he were allowed to finish his shower, it would be more clear what was going on, because... Well, I feel like this man's orgasm acting probably isn't subtle. Unfortunately, though, he never gets there, because before he can finish, Bigfoot comes into the bathroom and murders him dead. And honestly, the second that Morg's corpse hits the floor, this movie starts to pick up, because after that, there are no more long, boring attempts at eroticism. From here on out, if you get aroused by anything on screen, it's because you're into watching Bigfoot murder people, and that's your issue to deal with. After the shower scene, we check back in with D.B. Cooper so briefly that it's not even worth talking about, and then we head out to the woods where it seems that the turkey hunters have become the hunted turkeys. Uh, that, that actually worked out pretty well. Yeah, well, you know, you got Morgan. Kids getting married. He's got his whole life ahead of him, so I don't know. <laughs> it's like a... It's just a squirrel. Okay, I don't know what the fuck the squirrels sound like in the Pacific Northwest, but here on the East Coast, they don't growl like that. They... Well, actually, I don't know what sound a squirrel makes, but I feel very confident that nobody should be confusing it for Bigfoot. Also, I think that this was the moment in the movie that I started to suspect that Bigfoot might be a teleporter, because not only does he move from place to place at remarkable speeds, but he is also not subtle when he does it. So my only explanation for how he's able to get from place to place without being noticed is magic. Although I guess it might also be the case that these guys just aren't very perceptive. I mean, they do have trouble telling the difference between Bigfoot and a squirrel, so. And while these two are having trouble distinguishing animal calls, on the other side of the woods, the group of three is dealing with an entirely different call of nature. I don't know what I'm doing next, but I know what I have to do right now. Bathroom break. You're not going back to the lodge? I bear my shit on these woods, but I don't. He's the funny one. He goes home to dump out, and when his friend doesn't immediately respond to him, he starts freaking out in a way that feels like a bit of an overreaction to me. Morgan? You here? Morgan? 
Morgan. You better not be trying to scare the shit out of me, Morgan. Because it's just my work. Okay, little tip. If you think your friend might be trying to get a rise out of you, then don't tell him that what he's doing will work to get a rise out of you because that's just gonna make him want to do it more. Also, put your gun down, dude. Your friend didn't respond to you one time. The situation hardly feels like it requires firearms. This scene is everything that's wrong with the United States in a nutshell. Still, while I do think that he is overreacting here, it turns out that he's right to be afraid because his friend is dead and he is next. Now you drop your gun? Also, remember when I said I think Bigfoot might be a teleporter? A lot of the rest of the movie is just watching these guys come home and get murdered by Bigfoot. And it's honestly really not even worth going too deep into it. Except for one part. Because remember earlier when I said that there were no more attempts at eroticism? Yeah, that wasn't entirely true. The two remaining hunters in the group of three who didn't go home to take a poop continue in their efforts to try and kill a bunch of turkeys, but unfortunately for them, their hunt gets cut short when they're frightened but by, by the sight of a dead turkey, which honestly feels like something that they should have been prepared for. Where the hell are all the goddamn turkeys? Does this answer your question? Jesus. What kind of animal would do that? I don't know. A bear? I didn't come out here to hunt bears. Neither did I. Maybe we should get back to the lodge. Yeah, good idea. Let's go. Okay, I'm not an expert on animal carcasses by any stretch of the imagination, but I can say fairly confidently that no combination of all of those ketchup-covered femurs would result in a turkey. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but... I'm pretty sure that turkeys tend to have skulls. Also, all of these characters are fairly interchangeable, so it feels very weird to me that they would choose these two guys to be the ones in the scene because, like, we've already seen them get scared off by the idea of bears before. These are the same two guys we saw going for a run earlier, and lest you forget, that run ended like this. Hey, are there bears in these woods? I wouldn't count the possibility. You know, I'd feel a lot better if we had our rifles. Yeah, I think we can start heading back. Yeah, fast. The movie justifies them going back into the woods by saying that they'd feel safer if they had their guns with them. So seeing that pile of bones and thinking it's bears shouldn't scare them off because... Well, they have their guns with them now. And even if the movie is implying that they don't feel safe around bears even with their guns, then this still wouldn't make sense because they already thought that there were bears before they left for their hunt, so if having their guns didn't make them feel safer, they just wouldn't have gone out in the first place because... I don't know, this movie gives me a headache, but whatever, they go home. Change. You know what? Uh -huh. You're funny. You're funny. You're a funny man. What? Okay, I promise I'm not trying to be a dick right now, but I truly do not get the joke that was being made there. If I had to guess, I'd say that it was a meta commentary on how nobody in this movie ever wears any clothes, but if that's the case, then one, I feel like the characters in the movie shouldn't get the joke, and two, 
It's a terrible insult because the one saying it is half naked most of the time too. Glass house is my dude. The guy goes upstairs to try and heal those sick burns he just got and he once again finds himself in front of his mirror in his underwear while Bigfoot watches. This time, though, Bigfoot isn't content to just watch from the shadows. I say this without exaggeration, this is truly one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Sitting through it caused me physical pain and I will forever regret the moments of my life that I lost to watching it, but this scene? I'm not gonna lie, it almost made it worth it. And if Bigfoot had taken things further and leaned in for a little kiss, I may very well have come away from this thinking it was the greatest piece of media ever made, but unfortunately that doesn't happen, he just murders the dude. <laughs> and yeah, that's pretty much all there is to this movie. Uh, unless there are some loose ends I'm forgetting about that are still left to tie up. Oh, right, D.B. Cooper. While the rest of the gang is back at the house getting murdered, the group of two is still out in the woods hunting turkeys. Okay, have I just been staring at this movie for too long, or were those two just walking at a 45 degree slant? What happens next is very confusing, and I've done my best to try and decipher what I think the movie is going for, but I might also be very wrong, because if this is what they're trying to do, they don't do it very successfully. Basically, the main dude says that he has a bad feeling. What is it? Nothing. You just hear stories about out here. What kind of stories? Local legends about some kind of creature roaming these woods. Bigger than a man, stronger than a bear. You can't tell me you believe in those things. I don't, but I do trust my instinct. That's why I'm still alive. And my hunch is that the movie is trying to make the audience think that Bigfoot is about to attack. I think that they're trying to suggest that the main dude is sort of like a final girl who makes all the right moves and survives while his hunting buddy doesn't listen and stays out and gets killed as a result. And if I'm right in what I'm saying, then I think that they were hoping that what happens next would come off like a huge twist. You want to head back to the house empty handed? Come on. These turkeys aren't going to shoot themselves. 
No, look out. And like, don't get me wrong, I didn't see that coming, but I think that had less to do with strong storytelling and more to do with the fact that I had absolutely no clue what the fuck was going on in this scene. After dwelling on it for a while, my best explanation is that at first, we were supposed to think that the main dude is trying to get them to go home because he had a hunch that Bigfoot was about to attack them, but then once he knocks his partner out, we're supposed to realize that he was making that Bigfoot stuff up to try and scare the dude off because really, he just wanted to be alone. And like, maybe I'm wrong because I did not actually get that from watching the scene. I only came to that conclusion after spending way too much time trying to make any amount of sense out of what I just saw. And truth told, I'm not particularly confident that anything that happens in this movie actually played out how I described it. The, the, the plot is confusing and this entire video has really just been a guessing game for me. Still, this is my best guess at what's going on and if I'm actually right, then I feel like he probably could have tried a couple of other tactics between trying to scare that dude off with a story about Bigfoot and bludgeoning him unconscious with the barrel of a rifle because, well, those feel like two very different extremes to me. Not for nothing, but as we've seen earlier, telling people that you have to use the restroom is a very effective tool for excusing yourself, and unless you do it very badly, it doesn't risk leaving anyone with brain damage, so... Yeah, maybe just keep that one in your back pocket for next time. What's done is done, though, and the main dude knocks the other guy out because, twist, he is working with D.B. Cooper. Granted, that only really worked as a twist for me because by this point I had genuinely forgotten that D.B. Cooper was in this movie, but still, I was surprised nonetheless. As it turns out, the main dude was at the cabin because this is D.B. Cooper's drop zone and he is Cooper's man on the ground. And now it's time for D.B. Cooper to jump from the plane and for this movie to hastily merge its two storylines together. Right on time. Any problems? Piece of cake. You? There were some college kids at the lodge that I had to take care of. I hope nobody got hurt. A bump on the head, he'll survive. <laughs> yeah, okay. That wasn't a bump on the head. You literally knocked him out and abandoned him in the woods. Also, for the record, he doesn't survive. We see him get killed by Bigfoot in the next scene. And I have to imagine that if he hadn't been dealing with a concussion, he would have had a much better chance of survival. Despite the brutality he showed towards him earlier, the main guy gets worried when he hears the other dude's dying screams, so he runs towards the house to check on him. Once he gets there, he finds the corpse of his fallen hunting buddy breathing heavily and the giant woodland ape of legend standing over it. Ernie, what the hell is that? Better question. How far away did you park your pickup truck? I parked about 10 minutes away from here and hiked the rest of the way. Excuse me? Okay, when I watched that dude walk for 10 minutes straight at the beginning of this movie, I had assumed that the implication was that he had taken a long journey in order to get to the cabin. I don't know why, but finding out that I was actually watching every step of a relatively short hike from his parking spot makes things way worse. Whatever though, fuck this movie. At least finally now the two title characters have come face to face. So here it is, the battle you've all been waiting for. Why can nobody in this movie shoot a gun? No, it's not gonna end like this. The most successful air piracy in American aviation history is gonna be foiled by some mythical creature. Okay, I know that this movie is called Bigfoot vs. D.B. Cooper, but in a million years, I never would have guessed that that was alluding to a fist fight. Thank God. 
I was wrong. Bigfoot has the upper hand for a while because, well, he's Bigfoot, but just when he's about to deal the final blow, D.B. Cooper turns things around and proves that he's every bit the badass we imagined him as. Not my money, you big hairy son of a bitch! And you might think that things couldn't possibly get any weirder than watching Bigfoot smash his head on a rock and die, but you'd be wrong, because this movie still has one last inexplicable twist up its sleeve. Oh my god, you did it! You stole $200,000, jumped off a plane, and killed one of the greatest urban legends. You're famous. Yeah, yeah, I'm famous. And, and you can't tell anybody about this ever. Uh, uh, yeah, I think you should go, Bernie. Well, you're coming with me, right? I don't think so, buddy. You got me. That's just a scratch. No, it's not a scratch. It's a mark. Get out of here. Get out of here! No! Can I, can I at least have the money? <laughs> yup. Apparently, Bigfoot has similar properties as Dracula, and by biting D.B. Cooper, he's caused him to transform into a Sasquatch. At no point during the movie did they ever allude to the fact that Bigfoot worked this way, but... Whatever, D.B. Cooper is Bigfoot now. End of film. Uh-huh. Uh-uh. Having now seen this movie after the many, many hoops I had to jump through in order to do so, my biggest takeaway is this. Some things are better in your head. I'm not gonna lie, when I saw the title of this movie way back when, the idea of it felt really special. It's just so weird and so stupid and so clearly just shouldn't exist, but on top of that, it's also kind of a good premise that I think has a lot of potential to be really entertaining. Like I said, based solely on the title, I had a very clear idea of what this movie should be, and that movie I imagined is goddamned perfect. And I think that's why I was willing to do so much just to try and watch this thing. I kind of felt like I had to see it, you know? Even though I knew almost instantly that watching it wouldn't be anywhere near as interesting as I hoped, I still felt the need to seek it out because like, w what if it was? And now that I have watched it and can safely tell you that it's somehow even worse than I was expecting, I gotta tell ya. Part of me wishes that I had just let it exist as an idea. Don't get me wrong, it's not without its moments, and I feel like I probably got a pretty good thumbnail out of it, but it is truly hard to express in words just how excruciating the experience of sitting through this movie is. Like, like, like I don't know how to explain it exactly, but I feel like I'll probably die at least one day earlier now than I would have had I never watched it. That is the toll it has taken on my body. And honestly, even if it wasn't terrible, if most of the plot wasn't just dudes walking to their destinations and D.B. Cooper was actually in it, it still probably wouldn't have been as good as the version of it that existed in my head because, well, nothing is really as good as the version of it that exists in your head. The last time I made a video about a decocto film, the conclusion I came to is that these things are only able to exist because we as humans are hardwired to expect more. We can look at a DVD cover like this and build it up enough that even though you're getting every indication that the movie attached won't be worth your time, it's hard to shake the feeling that, I don't know, maybe it is. And in my last video, I don't think I painted this quality in the best of light, but I really do hope that I didn't make it sound like an entirely bad thing, because when you actually stop to think about it, 
There's honestly something kind of remarkable about that. By knowing less, we're able to turn the world around us into something way more, and I think that honestly makes it a much more interesting place. It's the difference between this and this. So, for as nice as this trait we all have is, it's also kind of frustrating, because I feel like part of being human is always trying to know more and more. We're always having new experiences, and seeing new things, and taking in new information, and every time we do, it makes it that much harder to look at the world with the sort of magic that can only exist inside your head. And it's just going to keep getting harder and harder, because as technology increases, and more people are able to uncover more and more truths, there's going to be less and less of the sort of stuff that's just outside of our frame. I made fun of this movie a lot for being the least sexy shit to ever exist, but the more I think about it, the more I think that that's my issue as much as anything. For as weird and dull as it is to watch 12 minutes of people changing into shorts, I also feel like it's made infinitely weirder and duller by the fact that at any point during this movie, I could have taken out my phone and found something a million times more graphic in 12 seconds. The entire time I was watching this, I just kept thinking that if I wanted to, I could probably find footage of someone in that exact Bigfoot costume doing things too horrible to speak aloud before the guy even made it up the stairs. I mean, for the record, I don't want to, but knowing that I could does make seeing a guy shirtless feel a lot less interesting. Because for what it's worth, I feel like if I could go back in time and give a copy of this to some gay teen in 1971 when this movie clearly takes place, it may very well be his favorite thing to ever exist. Although, for the record, I probably wouldn't do that. That feels like a questionable use of a time machine for a whole host of reasons. I truly don't think that this movie is for anyone nowadays, though, and I think that's because we have so many options of ways to see so much more than what it's willing to show. When you know there's the possibility to delve a little deeper, it's really hard to accept it when things are left with a little mystery. Because the thing about mysteries is that they're meant to be solved. Our love for them stems from our desire to destroy them, to slowly unravel them until they stop being mysteries anymore. And that kind of sucks because, like I said, if there's one thing I love, it's a good mystery. This is Robert Rackstraw. This is Kenneth Christensen. This is Richard Floyd McCoy Jr. These men are three of the top suspects for the identity of D.B. Cooper, and even though I spent way too much time thinking about them and other suspects like them, something about actually seeing their faces kind of bums me out. They're just not D.B. Cooper. I mean, maybe one of them is, I don't know, but like, even if they are, they're not D.B. Cooper. They don't have the allure of Cooper, they don't have his intrigue. They're all just some guy. And really, even if the real Cooper isn't one of these dudes, and it turns out he's the most alluring, intriguing person to ever exist with an amazing untold story to boot, I have no doubt in my mind that he'd still be a bit of a letdown. No truths could ever be as cool as what exists inside my head. And while that's a little bit frustrating, I'm also kind of happy that's the case. It means that the world I live in is much more interesting than the world around me. So I'm going to go spend way too much time and energy and brain space delving into the mystery that is D.B. Cooper. But I'll be honest, I hope to God it never actually gets solved. But yeah, that's my video. Please like and subscribe. Like and subscribe and share and comment and support me monetarily if that's something that you're, you're able to do and want to do. The best way to do that is via my Patreon, which you can find a link to down below. But you can also do it via Super Thanks, which is this thing on YouTube that I just found out about and I am very on board with. 
Which, speaking of, I got some new super thanks that I would like to super thank back. So, um, thank you to Ashley Boots, MHL Guitars, Wit Alleys, The Asterisk, Mero, Merobiba, Merobiba, Merobiba. I'm bad at reading. Mitzi S., Artie Gibson, and Yes I Am, please. Very much appreciated. And like, I'm still trying to figure out a proper thank you for the super thanks. I'm just going to keep reading them out at the end of the video and saying thank you unless anyone has any suggestions otherwise. But I also realized that there are people on Patreon who uh, also gave me money and are not getting read out. So if you are a patron of any tier and uh, would like me to read your name out as a thank you for like, like you super like me, then um, this is my email. You can just email me and say like, hey, can you shout me out? And I'll, because I appreciate you too. I don't want anyone feeling like they're getting stiffed. I just want to make sure everyone knows. I, re I really appreciate the support. It means the world to me. And um, I'm not good at uh, taking people's support. So... I'm trying to figure out how to how to do that because it ha it has become a large part of my job. But anyway, that's my video. Please like and subscribe. I already said that. Goodbye. Hello again. Uh, it's time for everyone's favorite part of the video, the part that is not scripted. And so I struggle to speak English while I pose for a thumbnail while my patron's name scroll. So like I said, this entire movie is basically just clickbait, which means that its poster is very good at getting people's attention already. So I figured I might as well just use the poster as my thumbnail and in that poster, I will be playing the role of D.B. Cooper. So I got um, some sunglasses and I got a tie. Uh, I didn't get a briefcase because that felt too expensive for, for a thumbnail, but um, I'm gonna put on this tie now. Most of this section will probably just be me trying to figure out how to tie a tie which like I should know because I used to wear one every day for like eight years. How long was high school? That'll do. That'll do, pig. All right, so I put that there. Hopefully that didn't cover up the mic too much, but the mic's not super interest important right now, so... um. Maybe if maybe I'll use my knitting as a so like so I'm I'm DB Cooper so it's like his let's see his his tie is flying so I'll try to make mine he's like this like that so like get a fan in here. No, I shouldn't. My audio is already terrible. Um, maybe if I just like... What is he? He's, he has a gun. I don't support that. Did he have a gun in the movie? I guess he did eventually. Um, is this picking up on mic? Ah, <laughs> there's a chance that this is just going to be inaudible. Again, though, most of my videos are inaudible. I have terrible audio. I think that, I, I bet that one was the one.
What would DB Cooper do? Maybe just like. Should I go this side? Maybe it's better. Where is his tie? His tie's off the. This does it. The physics of the poster does not make sense. Like I'm looking. I have the DVD right here, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, I should have brushed my hair for it. DB Cooper was much better dressed than I am. We used to dress up to travel. God damn it. Or the millennials ruined it. Whatever. Um, I kept going because I was worried that... Wait. One more. I kept going because I was worried that I was going to go too short because I felt like... I was just doing the same thing a bunch of times, but now I feel like I'm going on too long, so I'm going to call it there. But thank you for watching. I hope this video doesn't get demonetized too quickly. Willie out.